Welcome back. This is the third lesson of our Stay Home Art Challenge watercolor workshops and today we're going to start our first painting. And the most important part of beginning a painting is having an image that you feel is best served by using watercolor. So the image I'm going to use is this. And this is a field my wife and I came across when we were up outside Savannah, Illinois. And uh, I think there's a lot of, of uh, pretty neat things about this, this image itself. One of the things that I like especially is, is these great clouds and these, these you know, bulbous forms, uh, which is echoed with the, the shape of the... Uh, haystacks in the foreground. So how do we approach starting a painting? There's a lot of different ways and it oftentimes will depend on, on many different factors, but um, I typically like to start with my area of lights and it's not necessarily that I want to define everything in those sections, but instead that I give uh, indicators of other action that will occur. So Typically, I like to start off with a neutral, and to that end, I'm going to mix up on my palette just a, a little bit of blue and red to give myself a little bit of a purple, and then I'll knock that down until I have just a very light neutral tone, just a middle gray. So if you're looking at the palettes you did earlier, so that would be this kind of light gray. And, and I'm not doing a whole lot of defining, I'm just giving myself indicators so later on I can really bring this painting up. So I have my middle gray, and the first thing I'm going to do, make sure my brush is clean, and load it up with that middle gray. And I'm just going to begin using a very, very subtle color. I'm just going wet on dry, but I'm moving that around. And I like having a little bit of pigment in my water as I'm moving it around so that I know where I am painting. You can always look for that sheen of gloss of the water on the page in order to reveal that, but it's just as easy to give myself a very delicate little bit of color in order to do that clearly. So this is a painting where I am not taping off the edges. That always becomes one of those formal questions. You know, how precise is your picture plane and there are a number of tapes you can use. This is a watercolor washout tape uh, that you could use in order to give yourself those, those tightly depicted uh, edges. And those are fine, but I, I kind of like just that little looseness. Now, I'm, I'm just doing a little wet on dry, making that blended. Now I'm going to come over to this other section. I'm just looking at where the cloud is and where it's not. So watercolor is all about patience and having the patience to let things sit. And in order to make a successful painting, you really have to allow areas to be bone dry. Bone dry so that you're not bleeding water into another area and you're not messing up those things which you, you value. So 
Now, because I'm giving just this very light tone to the space, I'm not going up into this cloud. I'm just doing this area, which is generally going to be considered blue. But because of that, this area of the cloud itself will pop. Now, there are areas in that cloud, the fluffy areas, which will originally receive some color which is very similar to this background color, but I'm just, I'm just giving myself those indications. Now there's some er other areas that I can start giving some indications of as well, just laying in some value. I'm doing all this very light. I'm just locking things up. So we have this shadow on the side, and this is of course going to go much darker later on. I'm just looking at defining those forms. I like to use a big brush for this. I don't want to be precise where I'm very rigid about how I'm constructing the painting. There's a whole lot of time to, to get anxious later on. At this point, I'm just laying in those forms. So there's some other shadows. I can lay those on ever so delicately. And we'll come back to that. And then there's this lower area of these trees. And again, notice how soft I'm going. If I'm on my value scale, none of this is even getting into a middle tone. This is all just fairly light. So I can come in later on and really have some fun with that with some washes, but I'm just setting up my structure. You can see I have some pencil lines that I did just as a quick sketch of what the composition was going to be. Uh, those can be erased later on. If you have a pencil line on a piece of paper, you can erase through the paint in order to release those. But if you look at a lot of, of famous watercolor artists like uh, Winslow Homer or John Singer Sargent, you'll still see in those paintings that they have pencil lines uh, still visible. So it's not, there is no sin in having those pencil lines. Those are the indicators of how you're defining the composition. So, okay, so I'm going again here. This is all just not even a middle tone yet. But I want to have some fun with that. I don't want to make it too rigid. Notice that I'm stopping just short of interacting with those areas that are still wet. Because if I touch that, that area, that paint will bloom out and I'll get uh, areas that I can't control, which, which you want to avoid. So again, just my middle tones. I'm just laying in delicate forms. I'm not going to go too crazy with the tail. Things will reveal themselves over time. Okay, so that's really all I want to do at this point. I want to let the watercolor sit and, and dry. Uh, there's a couple different things you can use in order to expedite the drying process. Uh, the simplest, and I think the best, is just setting it outside in the sun so that uh, the water evaporates and the paper becomes dry. You can also use a hair dryer. Uh, the one problem with the hair dryer is if you have any sort of puddling at all, if you're blowing the, uh, the paint around, you can be moving that water, taking the paint with it, and give yourself all sorts of, of paint in areas you don't want. So I would suggest you avoid that. But for, for this point, I think we're good. I'm going to set this outside and let it dry for a few minutes, and we'll come back and take a look at it. I want you to note that this gray is different than this blue. So I, I did that uh, consciously. I want to be able to bring these areas up. Uh, this gray will serve as an underpainting for, for the blue of the sky that we'll see uh, in just a few minutes. So 
I hope your is dry and it's ready for me to paint on again. Now one way you can tell when your paper is dry is if you press with the back of your hand across the, the page and if it feels cold at all that means there's still water in there and it would still respond um, more like a sponge. So you don't want to press with the front of your hand because you have oils on your hand and you'll transfer those to the paper and then you could have some complications as, as the, uh, the oil from your hand acts as a resist and doesn't allow the paint to flow in the way you want. So I'm pretty happy with that as a, as a nice step. The next thing I want to do is continue with those light tones and start describing some of that space on the interior of these clouds. And again, we want to be very light with this. We want to be able to utilize the white of the page. So we have the nice light source and we get those things which make us really like watercolor, which is those, those areas of glowing light which you achieve through management of your value structure. So I'm just laying these on wet and dry, but I don't want it to seem that rigid. So because it's such a light value, I can load up a brush with mostly water and apply it really paint with that water in a way that it'll push that paint away and I'll get these gradated areas where the pigment is pushed and it ends up having these organic bleeding forms. And that becomes something that you, you really will learn to appreciate as you paint more watercolors. Ultimately, uh, I think most paintings are successful when you're implying action as opposed to describing it. So the more ways you can manage to imply action, the better off you'll be. I'm, I'm picking up a little bit more of these grays because those clouds were pretty blue-blue, uh, even though at a very light value scale. So I'm picking up just a little bit more blue, and I'm going to work on this bottom area. And just give some indication of these clouds happening here and even though there's not very much color here at all that's probably all the color I want for this section it's very low value it's very delicate I just want to move that around so that when we paint the tree on top of this area we aren't just dealing with that stark stark white of the page and although optically, this will all read as a white, it's so delicate that it'll allow a lot of other stuff to happen. You can see how just that little bit of water pushed the, uh, the paint off to the edges and so it gives us those sharpened um, organic edges. That would be really tedious to try to create independently. Alright, so that's pretty good. If I don't want some of that, I can just adjust it using mostly water. But you know, overall, I like that pretty well. I'm going to bring up just a little bit more of this middle tone value in a couple places where I know I want to start describing those forms. That's pretty good. Keep that down. Nice. So, 
There's a lot of stuff here I like. The other thing to think about is anytime you create a composition, you want to have uh, areas of thirds. So in this case, the lower landscape is one third and the sky becomes two thirds. So eventually I'm going to paint this area kind of a green. So to set myself up for that being a green in the future, I know that I want that green not to just be strident throughout. So I'm going to take this very light red, which is the complement of green, this very light red, and give myself just a very delicate underpainting. And that will allow some of those greens to appear more grayed out. And it's really, the way this composition is, it's really just in the foreground. Now red is a warm color, and so it's going to pull forward. Warms pull forward, cools push back. So I'm setting up that. And I'm not really defining anything here. I'm just giving myself a field of color that I can respond to. So I'm bringing just water in from this point just to make that a gradated value. And so when I paint the greens on top of that, it'll make some more sense. Oftentimes we talk about grass is green, apples are red, and those are, those are local colors. Those are local colors, but they do not serve to help explain the painting. So having a more sophisticated palette especially when you're working with a low color range, gives you the opportunity to be playful and investigate. So I like that pretty much. I can see that area dried out, so I got some of that bloom, so I'm just gonna come back over, and I'm gonna scrub a little bit. And scrubbing is something you can do. It's a good thing to do, but up to a point. If you scrub too much, you could take off that sizing, and then you won't have control as you try to do other bits of painting on top of it. So that's pretty good. I'm going to add just a little bit more here. And that'll serve to bring forward these areas just a little bit when I do the painting on top. Okay. Nice. Now we'll go back outside with this and let it dry for another 10 minutes in the sun. Notice that I have no areas that are puddling, no areas that are, are drenched. I haven't scrubbed a lot. This is all very delicate underpainting as I'm building the composition up slowly. The entire structure of the painting, and if we have a value scale of 1 to 10, we have probably gotten, you know, if, if 1 is, is the very lightest and 10 is the very darkest, we're probably at a 2.25. There's not a whole lot of value that we've applied yet. So really we can do a whole lot of different things at this point. I'm going to just continue to modify this interior section of these clouds just to give them a little bit more action because when we do the blue of the sky over there, uh, that's going to seem pretty pronounced. But the more controlled and delicate we can be here at this point, that's going to be an area we really focus on. On the finished work, and now is the perfect time to do it. So I'm not infringing upon that white halo around the cloud. I'm just working in this interior. And you notice I'm only using the blue and a little bit of the red. Just the blue and a little bit of the red. 
to help kind of define those areas. And then on the cloud section that's further back, I'm going even lighter and even more delicate. We're using atmospheric perspective in order to define these areas. And atmospheric perspective says that the further something is away from us, the less of a value shift there's going to be and the more blue it is. The thing to think about when you're painting a sky is uh, air is this huge weighted mass. So uh, you know when you swim at the bottom of a, of a swimming pool how much uh, more air pressure you have or water pressure you have. Well air pressure is the same way in that we have just a tremendous amount of air pressure at the surface and the higher you go up, the less it is. So there's all this density of air pressing down and that makes everything uh, more faint and, and uh, more difficult to see through. So that's really what our model is. I'm going to add just a little bit more action here just to engage that area. But again, I'm very, very soft with all of this. I'm not overworking any of that. Okay. So next we want to bring in our blues. And because because indigo is such a dark, dark color, or it can be, we don't want to go very dark here at all. So, again, I'm keeping everything within our middle range, and I'm just going wet on dry to give those clean edges. I'll allow some of that outline around these clouds, I can always go back and tighten that up just a little bit. Clouds are not necessarily very sharp edged. They appear that way because we have that distance from them. But the more diaphanous you can allow those to be, the better off you'll be. Uh, there's a great painter, Cousins, who uh, who was famous for his watercolors, and he would take uh, a rolled up piece of paper, a crunched up, like a tissue, and look at that in order to help him understand how light moved through clouds. And there's a lot to be said for that as a tool. So I have, you'll notice a little bit of sharper paint on those edges where I first started defining that, I can come in and just scrub delicately to bring that back. And that's pretty good. And I'll do the same thing here. Again, I'm just helping to define those. So the thing about the English watercolor method, here I'm using this traditional palette of indigo and Indian yellow or gamboge and Indian red. Uh, the thing is, if you give yourself a very limited palette, you can pick almost any three colors that will allow you to have um, some semblance of a full of a full range. All right, I like that pretty much. I don't like how blocky that is. So I'm going to take a brush that's completely dry and just use that to drag that around. I'm not adding water, I'm just dry brushing to soften those edges. Bring a little bit of color in to soften those edges. And that helps a lot. So I like that. I'm going to add some more water up here and bring that paint around. Now I'm going to load up quite a bit, relatively speaking, of that blue. And really just allow that 
to sit in those upper areas. And because I've laid all that water out, it's going to bleed naturally across that region, giving a real sense of, of organic movement. I can help it a little bit, but I don't want to do too much. I'm going to be making this area darker and because I'm working already here I'm just going to go ahead and bring some of that down same over here and for as much as I'm talking about going darker you can still see that I'm well within the middle range. But I'm going to lift off some of that paint and help make it seem a little bit more diaphanous, a little more atmospheric at the same time. So sometimes I'll see students that will scrub, scrub, scrub an area and then blot it hard with a paper towel. And I'm going to encourage everyone not to do that because that's, that's really what you're doing is lifting off your sizing. So if you have a pool of water, you know, you can always soak it up by touching at the water, but not the paper. But I'd never like to see someone smoosh onto the, uh, onto the, the painting itself, because all you're doing is removing the sizing. So the next thing we want to do is start establishing some of this lower area. And if we look at our value scale, you know, we have, we're pretty dark at the top, but we're still in those middle tones, so we're in fine shape. But what I want to do is establish some approximation of green. So I'll start off with my yellow, my dirty yellow, because my brush was dirty. And you know what? That's a pretty good looking green. So I'm just going to plug this in a little awkwardly at first. And I'll come back in with a smaller brush, kind of move some of those, those branches around so that it doesn't seem like the whole thing was painted with a half inch flat. And because we've done that underpainting with the blue, we can come in pretty quickly. use that existing value and underpainting to lay in. Now I'm going to switch to a smaller brush. Here I have just a liner brush. pick up some more of that yellow green mix and just make some more kind of organic branch shapes. Again I'm I'm more inferring than I am describing. 
and that's not bad. Okay, now I'm going to add a little bit more dark. And when that's dry, I'll come back over that area again. Now let me do the other area. Again, I'm not using any red at this point. I'm just using the yellow and the blue. Gamboge and indigo. And the thing to think about also is every tree, just like every face, is going to have uh, areas of light and dark. So if I were painting a face, the forehead would generally be yellow, yellowish. The eyes would be uh, red and the nose and then the chin would be more bluish. It could be very subtle shifts, but it's the same is true generally for trees as well. So we're just doing that the value shifts in space. So all I'm doing now is just kind of blocking in again middle tones. these trees. And I don't want to be dark, dark, dark. I don't want to even begin to approach, you know, these darker areas of the, uh, of the value scale because then these won't lay back. You want them to recede into space. And we do that, like Leonardo tells us, we do that by being generally lighter and generally bluer. So I'm just looking at those spaces between those shapes. And there is a little tree standing up in between in that clearing, but I'm not addressing that yet. And again, since I'm going fairly dark, and I know that this is going to be an area of more Clear darkness. There we go. I'm just going to start describing some of that form. I can add a little bit more wet on wet. over here to start to describe some of that as well. All right, that's pretty good. Now we're going to go back outside to dry in the sun. Start adding some more of our value structure into the trees. And while I'm mixing up a dark version of my green with my big flat, I'm not going to be using my big flat for most of this. I really want, especially in this tree group on the right, feel a little bit more organic. And so I'm going to go fairly dark, um, maybe four out of five or eight out of ten in my value scale. To move these forms around.
again, we're inferring, we're not describing. I'm not trying to show you what each and every branch is. Since I'm working up some of that value, I'll bring it around here. And then we'll go to the other side. And because it's further away, we don't want to be quite as dark. And in the same way that the clouds have a little bit of a halo of light, we're doing the same thing, especially over here with this group of trees. And it's important to change your brush, the size of your brush, on a pretty regular basis. The advantage to changing your brush is it allows you to make marks differently, in different ways. Imagine if you were golfing and you only used a sand wedge for the entire game. So you want to be able to give yourself a variety of tools so you're having fun and the viewer has fun looking at it. The thing to think about with artwork is if you aren't having any fun making it, no one's going to have any fun looking at it. So find pleasure in what you're doing. And this is my furthest space back, so I'm just going to give myself a little bit of light and color there. Eventually, I'll come in with lots of yellows in this foreground, but just to build up that transition space. I'm going to lay down a little bit of yellow now. So I'm cleaning my brush because I'm going to go back into as fresh a yellow as I can. Although it's not seamless, there is a little, it is contaminated a little bit, but that's okay. And because I've laid down that red before, I'm not getting a pure yellow. It's being modified already. But this is a really lovely way to start plugging in that foreground. And I'm not overlapping with the areas I've just painted. I'm allowing them all to exist separately so we're not bleeding between. Take this back outside to dry. All right. 
So we've been outside three times to dry it and it's done very well. There's really just a few more little steps to do. We want the hay to uh, be differentiated. So we're going to add a little bit of red just glazing across the top. Very transparent. We're leaving that little bit of light at the very top so we get the sense that it is being hit by those lights from above. And I'm going to darken this about halfway down so we get that gradation and the turning edge. The value shift gives us that turning edge. I like that pretty much. So I'm going to take that same red and apply it for these other haystacks doing the same thing. have that tree. And again, I'm using just the liner brush. I'm very delicately just going to paint a tree there. form there. And since I'm doing that, I may... I always like to think, when I have a brush in my hand, what are the areas I can, I can approach? So there's some branches up here, so I'll apply that. I'll come in, and I'll put in some of the branches that are there, just these little punctuations to imply action. Doesn't take a lot, I don't need to spend a whole bunch of time defining things, but I'm just giving myself some areas.
Okay. I think we're good. So that's how I bring up a painting. Several steps, allowing plenty of time in between stages, uh, being thoughtful about the overall finish, and not rushing it, allowing things to happen. So enjoy. Your project is to do your own version of this painting. There'll be a copy of the original source image as a link for you to download. Good luck.